is over 189 is our next song <clears throat> I'd like to welcome everyone to church this Sabbath morning. It's so good to see you all here. Oh, it's just a blessed Sabbath, isn't it? Uh, I want to make it, there's a, several announcements I want to make. Besides welcoming here, I want to mention that there will be a fellowship meal after uh, the uh, service here, to which you're all invited. 
I also want to mention that next Sabbath will be communion service. It's in your bulletin, but, uh, and there are several inserts in your bulletin that I'm going to draw your attention to, but uh, in case you don't read that, next Sabbath will be communion service. There's also going to be a women's ministry meeting after the fellowship meal. It'll be in Katie's room at the end of the hall. And uh, I want to make mention that, Jack, there is going to be next Sunday a benefit dinner called An Evening in Italy, and it's to help with the school. There's going to be a silent auction there. And then the other insert is about, uh, what's his name here? Rob Pell is going to be speaking uh, on GMOs. Now, I don't know if you all know what those are, but I try and stay away from them as much as possible. The other thing that's in, your, in there as an insert is a little paper for sermon notes. You know, uh, there are times when, and particularly I hope we're going to see some of those today, Jack might give a reference to or a quote from a place, and it would be good if we can jot it down and maybe go home and study it a little bit more thoroughly ourselves. So uh, those are some of the announcements. I believe Howard has an announcement as well, but I don't see. There's Howard. Here he comes. Well, I got a card, postcard this week. It's from Vernon Patty. I thought I'd read it to y'all. It says, Dear Friends, Missing you and our dear North Valley church family. Hope to return this spring. Keep the lights of God, uh, God's love burning in Merlin. We love you, Vernon Patty. So I will put this on the bulletin board out there so you can read it yourself if you'd like. Where are they? They're still back in Maryland. Maryland. John. Uh, have you heard anything about whether Pastor Bentley is still going to be our pastor or not? I don't think we're going to know that till at the end of the month. That was my understanding. It'd be. We were supposed to find out, I think it was yesterday or the day before. So, yeah. Well, apparently, I've not heard anything. Okay. But I, I know that there is a lot of things going on in the conference, and they were saying it by, by the end of April. Uh, there's going to be several changes made, so don't have anything official anyway. He may know, but I don't. Okay. Uh, our scripture reading today is taken from Acts chapter 2, verses 17 through 21. If you'll be patient with me for a second, I'll put my glasses on so I can read. And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaids I will pour out in those days my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in heaven above, and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness, and the moon into blood before the great and notable day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. You know, I believe we're living in the last days and that we are going to see stupendous things happen. We need to have the faith to call on the name of Jesus and we'll be saved. As far as possible, let us kneel for prayer. Our kind and gracious Heavenly Father, we truly thank you for another Sabbath day. Lord, you are so good to take us through every week, to give us time to contemplate upon how wonderful your love is. Lord, help us to worship you in spirit and in truth today. May your Holy Spirit take control of every heart here. And we ask you not only to bless us, 
but bless those who could not come and be with us as well. Lord, we pray for our brother Jack. May your Holy Spirit bless him as he brings a word from on high. Help us, Lord, to be faithful unto you, to allow Jesus to live and dwell in our hearts and work out in us a sanctified character that we may take it to heaven and be with you. Lord, just bless this church. Help it to be a light in this community and gather us all to be with you when Jesus come. May not one be lost. For we ask these things in Christ Jesus' precious, precious and holy name. Amen. Opening him is 163. Please stand. <clears throat> Now time for our tithes and offerings. I'd like to read out of Malachi 3, verses 8 and 10. Will a man rob God? Yet ye have robbed me. But ye say, wherein have we robbed thee? In tithes and offerings. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be meat in mine house, and prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be, there shall not be room enough to receive it.
Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you and we just thank you for this day, beautiful Sabbath day. Pray that you'll be with us through this service. Thank you now for the offerings we're about to take. I ask you to bless it and work it more than we can think and ask. Be with us now in Jesus' name. Amen. It is time now for our children's story. I believe Donna has our children's story. So if there's any kids out there, there's some baskets in the back. If you'd like to grab a little basket and collect some offerings for the school. So, do any of you like to garden? Yes? What do you like to grow in your garden? Kale, well, we have a lot of kale, and we have tomatoes, and... Kale, oh, okay, <laughs> if you have to. What do you grow in your garden? Um, I'm going to grow in... Till I go to my new house. I know. You want to grow cucumbers. Don't you want to grow cucumbers? Yeah, that's what I thought. Yeah. <laughs> Cherry tomatoes are way too hard to pick. So I love to garden. And I like to start my plants from seeds. 
And so every year I get a whole bunch of seeds and I plant them and I wait and I wait and I wait. So here's my, I, these are my little bell peppers. What do you think? They look like they came up okay, didn't they? Eh, bell peppers aren't really very edible, but you can put them in a lot of things. And some people like to eat them raw. But I planted, and it said they'll come up in about six days. So I went every day, and I looked, and I waited. And sure enough, on about day six, they all came up. Look at them. Look how tall they got. I was excited. I said, yes, God is helping me. So then I planted my tomato seeds at the same time. And they didn't come up. And they didn't come up. And they didn't come up. And I finally got the package out and I said, so what? It said six to 14 days. I said, I'm supposed to wait 14 days? That's two weeks. That's a long time to wait for a plant. But I went, and I looked every day, and there was nothing. There was nothing. And so day 14 came. At the end of day 14, I thought about a verse in the Bible that says, Be thankful always in all things. I was not thankful. And so I said, all right, God, we have to have a talk. So I sat down in my prayer chair and I said, dear God, this is your, Donna, your daughter, Donna, and I am not happy about my tomato plants. I did all of my part. I went and bought really good seed starting soil. I watered them every day. I talked to them nicely so they would come up. And there's not one plant. And so I want to know, since you're the creator God, when are you going to do your part? Thank you for hearing my prayer. I'll give you one more chance. Amen. So I went and checked again and again all day long, nothing. I got up in the morning of the 15th day, and there was one tiny, tiny little plant trying to stand up out of the dirt. And I said, oh, thank you. What am I going to do with one tomato plant? That's not enough. So I waited, and day 16, there was no more. There was just that one little plant. Day 17 was a Sabbath morning. And I went back there on Sabbath morning before I came to church. They were all coming up, all of them. Oh, I did a little dance the jig around my plants in the back room. And I said, oh, God, you do care. You care about all the things that we ask you. And I can do all of my part with the soil and the water and the light, but I can't make it grow. I need you to make it grow. Now, when you eat a tomato, did you ever look at the seeds in a tomato? See how teeny tiny they are? Yeah. Teeny tiny. Yeah, man, you can hardly even see it. But you know what? That's what makes the tomato plants grow. You dry these, and God said, now when you plant a tomato seed, you better not expect cucumbers because you're not going to get cucumbers from tomato seeds. But God said, every plant after its kind. So when you plant tomatoes, you get tomato seeds. See those? Plants, those are all my tomato plants from last year that I started that looked like those little tiny tomato plants right there. Isn't that amazing how big they got? Those plants are probably six feet high. And there were lots of tomatoes on them. I was so excited. And God really worked on my tomato plants. Look at that. 
that one tomato. Look at how we ate sandwiches off of that for weeks. It was so good. And that other little tomato that was next to it, that's the normal size of a tomato. But Randy and Valerie's little grandson, Cooper, he said, it looks more like a pumpkin. I said, yeah, but tomato seeds can't grow a pumpkin. So always remember, when you set out to do something, if you do your part and follow all the instructions, and then you talk to God, he will hear you. And if it's according to his will, he will answer and do what you ask him. You have a happy Sabbath today. And I'll try to remember better at First Thessalonians to be thankful in all things. Thank you. We are going to be blessed by part three of the Remnant Church from Jack today. And the scripture reading he wanted was from Matthew 24, 44, if you'd care to follow along. Therefore be ye also ready, for in such an hour as ye think not, the Son of Man cometh. And all I can say is, hurry up, Lord. Jack? Well, what a beautiful day the Lord's given us to come together and worship him. Aren't you glad to be in the house of the Lord? Amen. Such a wonderful gift. We have the privilege of worshiping him in peace. We still have that privilege. So we're grateful for that, aren't you? <clears throat> Well, today um, we are going to explore a little bit more, part three, this topic of the remnant church. And uh, one thing I was impressed to do this week was to ask Lisa, who does our bulletin, to put a little page in the bulletin. And uh, it, it just says sermon notes. Do you see that? So I'm going to uh, bring some things to your attention this morning. And I hope you will use this to read and research on your own. Why is that important? Because... In the end of time, when there will be a time of trouble such as never was, you will need the word of the living God in your heart and mind. Is that true? Amen. And the more you study it and familiarize yourself with it, the more you will be prepared for what is to come the most, as the servant of the Lord said, the most stupendous crisis that the world has ever seen. Can you see it shaping up? Yes. The new currency that's coming? All these things for the control of buying and selling and things like that. Coming steadily, steadily toward us. And we must be prepared in our hearts and minds to resist the power of the enemy. It will be brought to bear against God's people. Now, the classic definition of the remnant church, if someone said to you, well, you, you Adventist guys, you are, uh, you say that you're the remnant church, prove it. 
Where does it say that you're the remnant church? I don't see anything in the Bible about Seventh-day Adventists, do you? So uh, <laughs> how would you respond to that gauntlet that's thrown down? You're the remnant church, prove it. Where would you point them? I heard it, I heard Revelation 14, but I heard Revelation 12. And 12, 17 is the place in scripture that defines the features of the remnant church. There are two prominent features. And because of those two prominent features, the devil is what? Angry. Now, wrath is an Elizabethan King James word from six, the year 1611 when it was published. We don't use that word very much anymore, but it means very angry. And why is he angry? Because these people, the remnant of the woman's seed, keep the commandments of God and they have the testimony of Jesus. And if somebody said to you, so what is this testimony? We're just reviewing now. What is this testimony anyway? Um, in Deuteronomy, it says the testimony is, um, is the Ten Commandments. Well, if we let the scripture explain the scripture, as we find in chapter 19, what verse? Ten. 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 Defines what the testimony of Jesus is. What is it? The spirit of prophecy. So, two things. Number one. They keep the commandments of God, all of them. And by the way, we said that there are more than 10. Is that true? When the Lord said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, was that a suggestion or a commandment? It's a commandment. It means that when you make your priority list in the morning, you know, I have to do this and this and this and this, at the top of the list is to be what? Matthew 6, 33. But seek first the kingdom of God. That means that whatever the Spirit is telling you to do that day, that's how Jesus worked, by the way, day by day, Desire of Ages says that God established his priorities. And if you're willing to let the Lord establish your priorities, seeking first his kingdom will be at the top of the list, which means that maybe you make that phone call that you were promising to make and didn't make it, or to encourage someone, seek first the kingdom of God. That's a commandment, and if you keep the commandments of God, you will remember that. Now, the remnant church has a mission. This is just review now. What is the mission of the remnant church? The message of the three angels. We have a name for that. What's the name of <laughs> those messages? What do we call it? We call it present truth. You see, Noah Jesus said, as in the days of Noah, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. Noah had a present truth message for his generation. Is that true? He called them to repent. And he said, it's going to rain, and you better get on this ark. That was present truth. He preached for 120 years. And one day, animals started to show up. Two by two, seven by seven, for the clean ones. They filed into the ark. That was the first tangible indication to the people of that time that something was going down. But nobody paid attention except Noah's family. 
And when he preached the last sermon, he said, get on the ark, repent. Only his family got on board and those animals that were led there by the Lord. And the Bible says that the door was shut. And when that door shut, how many kinds of people were there on the earth? Two kinds, the righteous and the unrighteous, the people in the ark and the people outside of the ark. Weren't any Republicans, no Democrats, sorry. No dis rich, poor, black, white, no, no distinctions, just two kinds. Now, if Jesus said that that's the way it's going to be at the end, as in the days of Noah, so shall it be, it means that soon there will only be two kinds of people, and God is going to separate them. And when the gospel message is finished preaching, this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached, what? To all the world. And then the end will come. So when the gospel message has been preached and the last person has made a decision for God or for the enemy, the end will come and what's going to happen, happen to the ark of God which will have the righteous in it? What will happen to the door? It's going to swing shut. Probation will close. And how will God do the separation to make only two groups of people? What is he going to use to separate people into those two groups, righteous or unrighteous? What is he using? The answer is found in the first angel's message. Fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment. It is the judgment that does the separation. Now, if you think I'm wrong, you can raise your hand and challenge me, but you have to have some Bible to back you up, okay? The judgment separates the righteous from the unrighteous. Is that true? That's why we preach the judgment. And everybody thinks the judgment is bad news. How do we know that the judgment is good news? Is there something in scripture that tells us that the judgment is good news? How about the verse preceding verse seven? I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven having the everlasting, what's the next word? Gospel. What does gospel mean? Good news. And then he proclaims the judgment. Fear God and give glory to him for, that means because, the judgment is here. The hour of his judgment has come. The first angel's message establishes the fact that while the gospel message is going to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people, the judgment begins while the gospel is being proclaimed. We're the only ones that believe that. Almost the whole Christian world thinks that when you die, you're judged, you go to heaven, <laughs> or the hot place, purgatory, or maybe you're not so bad, so you go to limbo or someplace, you know, there are all kinds of Greek philosophies and whatevers that have come into the Christian church. And of course, Roman Catholicism has been foremost in marrying pagan idolatry to Christian theology. Amen. We are the only ones that believe that the judgment is good news, Amen. that it places the believer who is justified by the righteousness of Christ, it places that believer beyond the reach of the enemy forever. That's what the judgment does, and that's why it's good news. We have the good news. Is that true? 
all three messages. Babylon is fallen. There's an indictment of Babylon. And there's a warning against worshiping the beast and his image. And when that warning is given and the last person makes a decision, the next thing that we see in Revelation 14 is what? What do we see next? Well, before that happens, it says, blessed are they that Blessed are they, after the, three, after the warning against the beast and his image, it says, blessed are they that die in the Lord from now on. What that means is that some of us will be laid to rest. Are you okay with that? If you were laid to rest? Because the next thing that happens after the Lord declares that Blessed are they that die from now on, for they will rest from their labors. What verse is that? Come on, open your Bible. Let's, let's do it. You know, <laughs> where I come from on Sabbath morning on the country roads, I think I mentioned this, you'll see people walking along on Sabbath morning with a Bible under their arms. They're going to church. Used to be one out of eight people where I come from was a Seventh-day Adventist way back in the good old days, the 50s. But you know what? The next thing that happens after that verse, which verse is that? There is a scene that opens. It changes from earth to heaven. And what do we see there? A white cloud. And who's sitting on the cloud? Jesus. That is the coming of the Lord. And you know what the angel says? Right after we see Jesus sitting on the cloud, it says the harvest of the earth is what? Ripe. Every decision has been made. What is it that ripens the harvest in the Middle East? The latter rain. Now, if the harvest of the earth is ripe, it must mean that the latter rain has been poured out. Yes or no? Yes. yes. So this is after the outpouring of the latter rain. Jesus is seen on the white cloud coming. And the harvest of the earth is ripe. Now, our Lord told us that we have some work to do before he comes. Is that true? Notice. Let me get my next slide here. This is Mark 13. I forgot to do something. I forgot to ask for a couple of readers this morning. I beg your pardon. Do we have some microphones? Yes? No? I'm going to need your help again, because uh, even though I have this big screen, how about you? <laughs> And maybe, where's Ben? Is Ben here? Ben, would you be willing to read for us? All right, give Ben a microphone, and uh, maybe you get a microphone too, and we'll have you both help us out, or help me out, I guess. All right, Ben, would you read for us? On the screen. It's right on the screen. We have 
specific instruction from the Lord about what we are to do while the judgment is proceeding in heaven and the gospel message is being proclaimed to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. What's our job? Okay. You just, you just need to read the screen. You ready, Jack? Yes, I'm ready. Okay. Take ye heed, watch and pray, for ye know not when the time is. For the Son of Man is as a man taking a far journey, who left his house and gave authority to his servants, and to every man his work, and commanded the porter to watch. Watch ye therefore, for ye know not when the master of the house cometh, at even, or at midnight, or at the cock crowing, or in the morning, lest coming suddenly he find you sleeping. And what I say unto you, I say unto you all, watch. Now, this verse of scripture, some have interpreted to mean the coming of the Lord in the clouds of heaven. However, we have the testimony of Jesus. Is that true? Yes. yes, we have the spirit of prophecy. Now, I want you to notice how the testimony of Jesus interprets Mark 13. And uh, I'll have Ernie read this one. What does it say? Jesus, Jesus has left us word. Watch ye therefore. For ye know not when the master of the house cometh, at even, or at midnight, or at cock crowing, or in the morning, lest coming suddenly he find you sleeping. And what I say unto you, I say unto all, watch. All right, stop for a minute. Now, she's quoting what we just read from Mark 13. Do you see that? All right, continue. We are waiting and watching for the return of the master who is bringing the morning, lest coming suddenly he find us sleeping. What time is here referred to? Not to the revelation of Christ in the clouds of heaven to find a people asleep. No, but to his return from his ministration in the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary, when he lays off his priestly attire and clothes himself with garments of vengeance. And when the mandate goes forth, he that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he which is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. So, which coming is it? Jesus in the clouds of heaven? or the laying off of his priestly robes to put on the robes of vengeance, his kingly robes. It's the latter, isn't it? Yes. That's why Jesus said, Behold, I come as a thief. Because you see, in the days of Noah, that is the type. Remember what he said? As in the days of Noah? When the animals went into the ark, and God shut the door. That's what it says in Genesis 7. When God shut the door, my question is this. When were those people lost? When the flood came or when the door shut? It was when the door shut. Amen. The door of probation is when people are lost when that's shut. Because if you notice, when you read Matthew 24, it says that Noah went into the ark and the door was shut. And then he says, they did not know until the flood came and took them all away. When that door shut, they were lost, but they didn't know until what? till the flood came. You see that? So, our preparation is not just for the coming of the Lord. Is that true? In the clouds. What is it? In addition, it is to prepare for the close 
of probation and to realize that the judgment is going forward even when the gospel is still being preached to the nations. This is very important. This is Bible Seventh-day Adventist theology. And nobody else believes that. We do. We believe that the hour of his judgment is not coming. It has come. It is going forward. And you and I must prepare and be ready for the outcomes of the judgment. We must be watching, Jesus said, and praying and making sure that the truths of God are being stored where? In our mind. Right here, in the brain. Psalm 40 is a messianic psalm. Remember we talked about that last time? Verse 8, what does it say? We should know it by heart. I delight to do thy will, O my God, for your law is within my heart. This was a declaration of Christ from eternity. This is how he was successful in beating the devil. He loved his father and he took delight in doing his will. And you know what that verse says? I delight to do thy will, O my God, for your law is within my heart. It's saying that the will of God is expressed in his law. And John the Apostle said, he that doeth the will of God, can you finish it? He that doeth the will of God abides forever. The bottom line in your life and mine is to do the will of God. To have the law of love placed in the mind and written on the heart according to the new covenant promise. Everybody wants to be saved out there. Once saved, always saved, you know, all that. The plan of salvation, actually, it is a plan of redemption. Because in redemption, you're not only saved, you are transformed by the power of the living God in the heart and mind when the law is written in the mind and heart. The gospel involves not just being saved, it involves being transformed from glory, it says in 2 Corinthians 3, 18, from glory to what? To glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. We believe in the plan of redemption. In the plan of redemption, Jesus takes us back from the enemy. It's not just being saved, it's being redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, transformed, changed from glory to glory. Now, we have a great commission. And that com commission, in that commission, Jesus says what? Ben, could you read for us? It, what's it? On the screen. <laughs> I got to sit closer. <laughs> oh, okay. Come on up. Come on up right up front. It's all right. We'll wait. Don't be shy. I, I thought I was the only one that had vision problems, but maybe not. <laughs> Is that better? That's better. Much better. All right. Go ahead. Read for us. You did not choose me. But I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit, and that your fruit should remain, that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give you. Now, this is a very important declaration by Jesus. You didn't choose me, but I chose you. And I ordained you to do what? What are you supposed to do? Bear fruit. What kind of fruit? Love, joy, peace, 
patience, goodness, meekness, faith, don't forget the last one, self-control, fruit. Self-control. I was talking to Stephen's grandma last night and she showed me an article by Doug Batchelor. And I was gonna ask somebody to read it, but um, I'll just tell you the essence. I don't remember the publication it was in, but he pointed out that um, he, he made reference to Matthew 5:48, be perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. And he said, you know, <clears throat> out there in the world, we have athletes, and you know, when they're going after something, they're focused on everything. You know, they, they make sure their diet's okay, and they get enough sleep, and they're out there training every day. And he says, you know, we accept that in the, in, in the athletic world as just that's how you pay your dues. That's how you get to be number one as an athlete, right? You pay attention to the details and to making sure that you can compete with the others. He said, why is it that when we talk about Christian perfection, everybody says, oh no, we, we don't have to uh, go to that, those lengths like athletes do because well, you know, we don't want to be legalists. So why is that? Shouldn't we have the same attitude? You know, when you look at 1 Corinthians, uh, where did we go last night, Amy? I think it was uh, 1 Corinthians 9. Paul talks about running a race. Do you remember that? And uh, he says, you know, they do it to get a perishable crown but he says, we, we do it to do what? Get an immortal crown. In other words, we should be putting the same effort into our Christian experience to be like Jesus. As athletes do in performing just to get a perishable crown because that crown is not going to mean anything when the sky opens and Jesus comes. It's going to be all, you know, all the Oscars and the accolades and all the things that people put value on right now. None of it will make any difference. What will make a difference is whether you run the race and you decide that you want to be like Jesus. That's what counts because there is nothing that you will take from this world, nothing but your character. That's it. We're done. Your character. That's the only thing that you will take from earth to heaven. And the question is, how much attention are you giving to your character? Are you like Jesus? Do you say words that you end up regretting? Do you have attitudes toward people? in the church or your family or wherever? Resentment, irritability, all those things we must strive as athletes strive to overcome. Now, would you read the second part of that for us? Go therefore and make, all, make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Notice that we are to teach them what? The commandments of God. You see that? We are to teach them. Now, it's time for a little tough love. I love you. Ernie, would you read for us? Watch for souls. There are some now claiming to be followers of Christ who in the judgment will be confronted by their friends and neighbors who will be confronted by their friends and neighbors to whom they might have pointed out the way of salvation, but whom they allowed to remain unwarned. Then they will hear the terrible words why did you not tell us the things you claimed to believe? 
Why did you not seek to help us understand the truths of God's word? We have a responsibility to those around us. Is that true? Every one of you seated here this morning has a gift. If you have invited the Lord Jesus into your heart and mind, you have a gift. Some of you are mechanically gifted. Some of you have a big mouth like me. And some of you have what the servant of the Lord calls 10 talents. What is that? 10 talents. Rosie Hurd published a book way back in the 70s, a cookbook called 10 Talents. What is that? The ability to prepare food in a tasteful, attractive manner. It is a gift. You know, they say the way to a man's heart is through his stomach. I have news for it. It's through a woman's stomach, too. Uh, we all love good food. Is that true? Come on. We love good food. And people out there are just like us. They love good food. You know what? Take a loaf of bread to your neighbor. Share your gift. If you have the gift of evangelism, like, uh, like Emil does and Harry, use it. They're using it. I don't know that I have that gift of evangelism, but you know what? As I'm reading the research about health, it's telling me that I should take a walk after the meal. So I go out and I do a little 15 minute walk. And you know what? In this right rear back pocket, I have a book. And I have a reversing diabetes brochure. Because in the morning I pray, Lord, take charge of my day and help me to accomplish all that you have in mind for me. And sometimes on the road, I'm just walking down the road and I meet someone Take a book with you. Don't leave home without it. I'm not talking about the American Express card. I'm talking about a book. Something. We have a responsibility. I don't want to meet people in the judgment that tell me, why didn't you say something? Why didn't you warn me? God wants us to be ready. Um, I think my next slide is going to... <clears throat> Let's see, is it your turn, Ben? But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. So what are we supposed to do? Be ready once in a while? What's the next word? Always. always. That means when you go to the supermarket, you should be ready. When you go to pick up the kids from school, you should be ready. That's what always means, right? When you go on a walk or you go out for recreation to the park, you should be ready. John Lomacang of uh, Three Angels. Uh, Stephen, do we have one of those books here today? That uh, black one? Okay. I should have uh, brought one. Um, he publishes a book called, a, a little half page, I guess, format called The Three Angels' Messages. That's a book I believe that we should mail to this community. Yes, it's pricey to do mailings, 
But you know what? They're much more likely to read a small book like that than perhaps the great controversy. We've done a mailing. How long ago did we mail the, the great controversy? Anybody remember? Last year sometime? It's time for another. That message of the three angels is beautifully encapsulated in that publication. And it's just a thin little thing like that, you know, half a page. But we need to do that. What about Sabbath afternoon? One Sabbath per month dedicated to going out and reaching out to this community. One Sabbath afternoon per month. The rest of the time, we can sit around and talk about the things that we usually talk about on Sabbath. But shouldn't we be making a sacrifice of some kind to reach this community, yes or no? We should. Maybe, uh, you know, how did Jesus send out the disciples when he was doing evangelistic work? Did he say, uh, Peter, I want you to go down to Gaza, and Philip, you go up here to uh, the north part of Jerusalem. How did he do it? Two by two. Two by two. Why, did he, why did he do it? Why did he ask them to go two by two? Any idea? Any thoughts? That's right. Was that John? Yeah. So John, I want to tell them about our little project. Can I tell them about our little project? Me and you? Yeah. Yes. Yes, like John. Oh, there's the right John. Okay. <laughs> John Horrocks, right? Okay. So several weeks ago, I said to John, you know, I've been thinking about something that I want to do to reach this community. And uh, he said, well, what is it? I said, well, it involves a question. And the question goes like this. I'm on video, right? The camera's rolling. And I say, have you ever wondered why most Christians go to church on Sunday? Sunday doesn't appear in the Bible. Sunday is the day that the pagans worship the sun god. The Bible doesn't call that day Sunday, it calls it the first day of the week. Why is that? That's because the days in the beginning when the earth was created and man was created only had numbers. It didn't have names. Only later on did we assign names to the days of the week. And so we roll on right through the presentation and we begin with the creation. Well, you know what? John, that considerable sacrifice to himself, came up to my house all the way in Azalea from Central Point on a Sunday morning, and we sat down and we recorded at the church right here. Not to my house. He came to pick me up, and then he brought me to the church, and we recorded it. And uh, one of these Sabbath afternoons, I'm going to share that little um, video presentation with you because I would like to mail it to this community. Is Glenn here today? No, Glenn Nelson? Yes? Glenn has been distributing DVDs for a very long time, but he doesn't have, he has a duplicator, but what we need is a duplicator that can do something like 50 at a time. Do we, do we have a price yet, Glenn, on how much uh, a duplicator would cost? Okay, uh, we probably need to research it. But listen, folks, people in this community need to be warned. What did the servant of the Lord said, say? There are two great errors that Satan will use to bring the people under his deceptions. What are they? 
immortality of the soul and Sunday sacredness. Now, if we know that there are two great deceptions that he will use to bring them under his power, surely we should be telling them what those two great errors are. Is that true? We cannot leave people in this community unwarned about what is coming. It is coming fast. The word on the street is that the new currency, the CBDC, don't forget, the Federal Reserve Bank ha already has a digital currency. It's called FedNow. Anybody here ever heard of FedNow? It's based on Bitcoin. It's the same technology. The word on the street is that the new currency will probably be in effect in the fall of this year. Remember, the president gave the order in, I believe it was March of 2021, to explore it. This is 2024. It's almost here. And the question is, what are you going to do when your assets are gone? Because remember what the servant of the Lord said, the spirit of prophecy? She said, every earthly support will be what? Cut off. What are you going to do when your bank account is frozen? John, did you watch that video by, by Eva Tompkins? The Adventist lawyer, did you watch it? Okay, what that video says, this is an Adventist lawyer. I believe she's from New York. She's a Wall Street investor, a lawyer. She said, there is coming something called a universal ledger. Raise your hand if you've heard of the universal ledger. Very few of you. What that means is that every asset that you and I have, they have plans to put on a universal ledger and it will have all of the attending documentation. If you have a piece of real estate, a house, the deed to that piece of real estate will be on the universal ledger. You know what that means? It means that they can do anything with it that they want. Are you listening this morning? Your stock portfolio will have all your 401k, your car, you know, your title to your car, all of the attending documentation will be on the universal ledger. The name of the video on YouTube, Eva Tompkins, is CBDCs. Are you taking notes on that piece of paper? CBDCs and their impact on religious liberty. Watch it. CBDCs and their impact on religious liberty. The things that we own right now, the assets that we have, soon will be gone. Are you ready for that <laughs> paradigm shift? If you're not ready, then it's time to pray that the Lord will make you ready. Because what it means is that we must invest in warning the people, yes or no. If I'm preaching heresy, raise your hand and tell me But if I'm preaching reality, then it means we need to get sober real quick. Amen. We are facing the realities that we have been preaching for a very long time, and it's finally here. Some, a member of my family said recently, 
It's not years away, it's months. Can you read the second scripture there for me? Wherefore he saith, Awake thou that sleepest and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. See that see then that ye walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. Are the days evil? Yes or no? And if the days are evil, if we see sodomy being exalted and all kinds of evil transactions going on, then it must be time to redeem the time. Amen. For the days are evil. So, what is your response this morning? What is the Lord saying to you? What gift do you have? Do you have the gift of music? Maybe you can use your musical ability to reach people. This morning as I was traveling, to, as I was walking actually before we were ready for, to leave, I thought, what if, we what if we put together a little booth down in Grants Pass or here in Merlin on the sidewalk with some books with uh, maybe John Lomacang's uh, publication on the Three Angels Message, um, other things that we could use, maybe some cooking videos or any number of things that we have. We have a large number of resources on our YouTube channel cooking demonstrations that we've done. We've done, Emily did a great series on canning, Emily and her team, probably three years ago, four years ago maybe. All kinds of things. What if we had samples of those that we could hand out? And what if we had a sign that said, America in Prophecy? And once a month, we had a little booth out here in Merlin or in Grants Pass, and we handed out some books, some tapes, some DVDs, whatever. Something to warn the people of what is to come. You know, evangelicals have their take on prophecy. Oh, you know, this eclipse that's going to happen on Monday? Oh, this, is, this was prophesied in the Bible. Uh, <laughs> Uh, um, Steve Gregg, the, uh, the Protestant preacher that used to be a dispensationalist and now is not, he calls it newspaper exegesis. In other words, the newspapers determine what prophecy says. If something happens in the newspaper, then it means it was in prophecy. Oh, here it is right in the book of Amos, you know. They can find it in, that. yes, the eclipse, that's in the Bible. <laughs> it's amazing. We do not use newspaper exegesis. The judgment is an event. It began at a certain time, and it will end at a certain time. And there are three phases. The first is the investigative judgment. Where is it found? Where is it found? Mm -hmm. Daniel what? Seven. The Ancient of Days took his seat. The court was seated and the books were opened. Right? Verses 9 and 10 of Daniel 7. The second phase, Revelation 20. It says judgment was given to the saints. Now they're looking over the records. This is in heaven. And the third phase, the dead stand before the great white throne. That's also in Revelation 20. Three phases of the judgment. You and I, who profess to follow the Lord, will be examined in which stage of ju that judgment? Which one? First, second, or third? 
the first, because that's what separates the righteous from the unrighteous and those who say they have faith in Jesus from those who do not have a genuine faith because it is not backed up by your works, as James says. So it separates the wise from the unwise. That is the first phase of the judgment. And that judgment, when it is completed, it does two things. One, it determines our reward. Don't forget Jesus said in Revelation 22, behold, I come quickly and my reward is with me. That means that the judgment has ended and your reward has been determined. But the second thing it does, and this is unique to Seventh-day Adventists, go to Daniel 7 and look at verse 21 with me. Daniel 7 and verse 21. What does it say? The judgment does two things. Well, it does more than two things, but two main things. It separates the wise from the unwise among the professed followers of Christ. And the second thing it does is what? What does it say? Ernie, do you have a mic? I don't have a Bible. You don't have a Bible. In my hand. I'll give you a Bible. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've got one. Got one now? Just tell me what verse. This 21. This is 16.5. It's even big enough for me to read. <laughs> I got this from Lisa. Gave me this gift. What does it say? Daniel 7, 21, the judgment does something. What does it do? That's why we preach the judgment, by the way, the good news. What does it say? I'm trying to get there. And I was watching. Yes, keep going. Verse 22. What does the judgment do? It says a judgment was made in favor of the saints of the Most High. What does the judgment do? It stops the persecution by the Antichrist power of the saints. Do you see that? Yes or no? It says they were persecuting the saints until. That word until is extremely important because what that says is it stops the Antichrist power from persecuting the saints in the end of time. And if you'll notice, the next thing that happens is they do what? They inherit the kingdom. Do you see it? Yes or no? So why is the judgment good news? Because it stops the Antichrist persecuting power in the end of time. It stops him. We should jump up and down like Pentecostals. (laughs) <laughs> because that's good news. How am I doing on time? How much? 12.15. Okay. Thank you. So we have a job to do. We have to let them know that the judgment is good news. We have to let people know in this community that the enemy has a plan but God has a bigger plan. We have to let them know that. We have to give them the warning of the first, second, and third angels. And we have to say to them, come out of her, my people. Who is the her? Babylon. Come out of her, my people. God has his people in Babylon. And at some point, they will hear his voice come out of her. And that is part of what we need to be saying to this community. Come out of her, my people. 
So I hope that you weren't offended by the tough love that we administered this morning. I hope that you have made a decision in your heart and mind that you will be part of this last message, the good news of the judgment, that we are to worship the Lord who made, create, who made heaven and earth. And as I said in another week or two, when John is finished with this little videotape we've been doing, I would like to give you a little preview right after lunch sometime. And if you think it's worthy of sending out to this community, then I invite you to invest in it so that we can give that warning that God wants us to give. We have a closing song. I don't know what the number is. What is it, Emily? 326. Dear Lord, our Father in heaven, we're grateful for the time we have spent today examining the good news that we have been commissioned to deliver to others. And we pray now that the spirit of the living God will take charge of our hearts and minds we pray that you would give us creative impulses to share this good news with those around us, our family, our relatives, our friends, fellow employees, our neighbors, our community. Help us, Lord, to remember that you have given us a gospel commission to share it with those around us we pray that you would empower us 
that you would give us a heart to do your will. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.